Hi, y'all. I've been in the South now 11 years, 12 years, so that y'all's coming pretty naturally to me. I think I've even developed a little bit of a Southern accent, but please listen to me anyway. Actually, I kind of like the Southern accent. It's a new thing. One of my biggest focuses with people who I see in my office and who I talk to them about kidney disease is understanding how potassium specifically fits into their diet. So it was an honor to work with the American Association of Kidney Patients for their Are You OK campaign. And I got permission from them to share this awesome Q&A video. People submitted questions from all over the country. And this is a long video, but it's really worth your time. We talk about potassium and we talk about low potassium substitutes for things like guacamole or salsa and how to fit potassium things into your diet and understand what potassium is. So I hope you stay tuned uh, for this video. I hope you watch the whole thing. There's tons of information in there. If you're interested in going more in depth on potassium and how potassium fits into your diet, if you have kidney disease, because this one really I made specifically for you people with kidney disease, then check out my book, The Cooking Docs Kidney Healthy Cooking, a modern 10-step guide to managing and preventing kidney disease. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to my website so you never miss a new recipe or a new health tip. Okay, take it away. Q&A on potassium. potassium. It's really important for people with kidney disease to understand how much potassium is in the food that they eat. Too much potassium, if it builds up in your blood, can cause heart problems. And if your kidneys are not filtering at 100%, or if you're on certain medicines, that can raise the potassium in your blood, you can have a tendency to have high potassium buildup and put you at risk for these heart problems. So it's really important to monitor the amount of potassium that you take in if you have kidney disease and understand exactly what your potassium limits are. So the American Association of Kidney Patients solicited questions from all over the country regarding potassium and boy, did we get some good ones. Some of these really made me think and are fantastic questions to help you understand why potassium is important and how potassium fits in to your kidney health. Let's start with Mark. Mark in North Carolina asks, I am newly diagnosed with kidney disease. What should I be doing as far as potassium for my health? Thanks Mark for that question. And Mark, know that you are not alone. There are 37 million people and climbing diagnosed with kidney disease in the United States. And I am so glad that you are invested in your health and trying to find out more information. The most important thing to do at this point for your potassium, Mark, is to find out where along the spectrum you are with kidney disease and to know what your potassium levels are in your blood. The potassium limitations for people with kidney disease depend on a lot of different things. People with mild kidney disease, that's usually stage one, stage two, or stage three A, usually don't have any potassium restrictions. And so for you, talk to your doctor or your dietitian and see if your potassium levels are normal and if you're at risk for high potassium. And if you're not, then you may not have any potassium limitations. On the other hand, if you're in stage four or five kidney disease or on dialysis, you may need to limit the potassium in your diet. So ask your doctor, what is my potassium level in my blood? Am I at risk for high potassium? And if you are at risk, then do exactly what you're doing. Look at the AAKP's potassium fact sheet and resources at ruok.org and Keep trying to figure out what foods you may need to limit to manage that potassium in your diet. All right, our next question is from Cecilia in New York. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Cecilia in New York City asks, do I need to stop eating all foods, fruits, and vegetables that contain potassium while I'm on dialysis? Great question, Cecilia. The answer to that is no, because really it's impossible to not eat anything that has potassium in it because almost all foods have some amount of potassium. So if you're on dialysis, you may need to limit some of the potassium in your diet. Not everybody does, but a lot of people who are on dialysis do need to limit that potassium. But there are ways to still enjoy some of your favorite foods. 
For example, as soon as people see high potassium foods and limits, they get rid of all the bananas, all the oranges, all the tomatoes, and that will certainly lower the potassium in your diet, but there are some people that just love tomatoes. So if you're on a potassium restriction, but you love tomatoes, maybe you can have a slice of tomato, two slices of thin tomato on your sandwich. So you can make um, changes to your diet without giving up all foods, drinks, everything that has high potassium in it. The other thing to do is to really work with your dietitian. Your dietitian, if you're on dialysis, can tell you your risk for high potassium and can tell you whether or not you need to be very strict with your potassium intake or if you can have some of these things that have high potassium in them if you're careful with the rest of your diet. All right, our next question is from Joe in Florida. Joe asks, there's a lot of talk about fruits and veggies with high potassium, but what about drinks? Should I stay away from certain types of drinks like juice, sports drinks, or milk? Joseph, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Some of those things actually have more potassium in them than the fruits and vegetables that you're told are high potassium to begin with. For example, B8 juice is concentrated tomato juice with all kinds of vegetables in there, and those are very high potassium and very high sodium drinks. It's so concentrated that one cup of V8 can give you a huge amount of potassium. The same goes with sports drinks and even with some milks. Renee in Dallas asks, can you tell me more about salt substitutes with high potassium? So this is gonna probably sound familiar to a lot of you, but many of you are told to eat a lower sodium diet. And sodium in the store for most of us is sodium chloride. So everybody with kidney disease needs to be on a lower sodium diet. So what do people do oftentimes? Is they go into the store and they buy the salt substitute, thinking that that will be a safer alternative to regular salt. The problem with the salt substitute is that instead of sodium chloride, it's potassium chloride. And so you may not be getting the same sodium load, but you are getting a potassium load. And if you need to limit the potassium in your diet, then the salt substitutes that are potassium chloride can be very, very dangerous. Plus, those potassium chloride substitutes, those salt substitutes, I don't think they taste very good. So stick with regular salt, just use a little bit at a time, and limit your processed foods and eating out, and that's the way to lower the sodium in your diet not by going with a salt substitute because that potassium chloride can be very dangerous. Adam from Iowa asks, are there foods to eat to help lower my potassium if and when my levels get too high? And that is just a great question. And the answer is no. There aren't any specific foods that you can eat to bring your potassium down once it gets too high. There are lots of medicines that you can take things that can help you get rid of potassium through your urine or through your stool that can bring the potassium level down in your body. But once it gets too high from the foods you eat, there aren't foods that you can then take in that will bring that potassium level down to a safe level. I hope you're enjoying these questions and answers. Make sure you join us on May 1st for National High Potassium Awareness Day, the Are You OK campaign. You can register at ruok.org. Make sure you sign up today. Lana from Illinois asks, how does low potassium affect the heart or other areas of the body? Truth is that low potassium can cause just as many problems as high potassium. The symptoms of low potassium can also affect your heart, so they can cause irregular heart rhythms the same way the high potassium can. And low potassium can also make your muscles really weak. Potassium is involved in the way the nerves and the muscles move in the body. And if your level gets down to a very low and dangerous point, you can have trouble moving your muscles. The good news is that with regular blood tests, you can see where that potassium level is and hopefully avoid both high and low potassium levels. 
for lots of educational resources, including an infographic and a fact sheet, make sure you go to ruok.org and download them today. Boy, these are such great questions. Callie from Virginia asks, I love guacamole and salsa. Any tips to substitute so that I can make low potassium guacamole or salsa? Let's start with that salsa. So salsa is typically tomato based. And one of the ways to make low potassium substitutes is to find an ingredient that is the same color, sometimes a little bit of the same texture that you can use to replace it. So I often will do roasted red pepper salsa or red pepper salsa. We're using red peppers instead of tomatoes. Green peppers would work as well as a substitute for a green salsa. Fruit salsa, if you pick the right fruit, can substitute for your typical tomato salsa as well, as long as you pick a low potassium fruit. So pineapple is a great example of a low potassium fruit and a pineapple salsa with pineapple, cilantro, red onion, some lime juice can be a great substitute. Now, what about the guacamole? The guacamole I think is a little bit harder, but still doable, just like the salsa. In guacamole, we want to pick an ingredient that is the same color and can be the same texture as avocados. Avocados are very high potassium fruits. So one way to do it would be to substitute green peas for that avocado. One cup of peas has about 350 milligrams of potassium. One cup of avocado has more than 700 milligrams of potassium. Jane from New York, Jane asks, with plant-based foods, you only absorb about half of the phosphorus. Is there any clinical research that is showing that we absorb less potassium with plant-based foods? Jane, I got to tell you, I had to look up the answer to this one because I wasn't sure. But there is a lot of research going on out there to demonstrate if that potassium in plants is absorbed and causes the same amount of problems as other types of potassium. Because you mentioned phosphorus and the phosphorus is so interesting because in phosphorus, we find that the phosphorus in plants are wrapped in these things called phytates. And so high phosphorus plants don't cause as much phosphorus absorption as things like phosphorus additives that are in like packages of crackers and cookies. That phosphorus is absorbed as 100%. So it's a great question about whether or not the same thing goes for potassium. And I think the jury is still out. So for now, we still have to be very careful with high potassium fruits and vegetables because you can get really concentrated levels. One thing that's interesting though is that high potassium fruits and vegetables often have a lot of fiber, which keeps your gut moving, which keeps potassium leaving your body through your stool. And so that may offset some of the high potassium in the foods you are still eating. The jury's still out, but great question, and I hope we know more soon. If you're interested in more educational resources, such as a potassium fact sheet, infographic, or pocket guide, make sure you head over to the National High Potassium Awareness Campaign website at ruok.org. Michelle from DC asks, I'd love to learn more about reading a food label and being able to tell if it's okay for a kidney transplant patient's diet. Thanks so much, Michelle, for that question. The thing about having a kidney transplant and being on a specific diet is it really depends on the level of your kidney disease. So people who have a kidney transplant can have stage one kidney disease where their kidney transplant works normally or they can have stage five kidney disease. So depending where you are on that spectrum will determine whether or not a specific food is appropriate for your level of kidney disease. Now it is key though, to be able to learn to read a food label. And the good news is that the government has made it much easier for us to read food labels over the last year. The things that are important for people with kidney disease are to understand serving size. So I've got a little food label here and you can see that it tells you in bold how much is in that serving size. So for this, a serving size is nine crackers. And then you want to look at sodium. So if you're picking a snack, if you can find something that's less than 200 milligrams of sodium, 
that will be counted as low sodium. Again, you have to stay in that serving size though. If you have kidney disease, you may also have to look at the protein in a food. And a lot of foods, almost all foods have some protein in them, even these crackers. So that will be listed in the form of grams. You can see it right there on every food label. And then of course, the topic of the day, potassium, is also required to be listed on all the food labels. These crackers have zero potassium. So it's important to know that those are the things that you're mainly looking at as a person with kidney disease and understanding how those specific limitations fit into your diet. The one thing that's not listed on the food label that people with kidney disease often have to follow is the phosphorus. And so the key to looking at phosphorus in a food label is to read the fine print. And in the ingredients, look for anything that has the letters P-H-O-S. So in these crackers, no phosphorus listed on the food label, but there is monocalcium phosphate listed in the ingredients, meaning that there is some inorganic phosphorus that is likely to be highly absorbable in these crackers. Sandy from Missouri asks, what is leaching potatoes and can you show me how to do it? And yes, Sandy, I can. Leaching potatoes is a process by which we take a potato, everybody's favorite food or a lot of people's favorite food, and leach out the potassium, meaning we'll take the potato, which is full of potassium, and we'll get rid of a lot of the potassium that is inside that potato so you can eat it uh, and not worry about having a really high potassium food. The keys to leaching potatoes are first to cut them up into cubes or slices. So the smaller the cubes, the easier that potassium will leach out. So we're gonna cut these into cubes. And then we're gonna put them in boiling water and let them boil for about 10 minutes. That will get rid of a lot of the potassium and bring it into the water. Then we drain them and we can cook them with much less potassium than they had before. Thank you all so much for watching. It was an honor to partner with the American Association of Kidney Patients. I'm Dr. Blake, The Cooking Doc. I'm also the author of the book, The Cooking Doc's Kidney Healthy Cooking, a modern 10-step guide to preventing and managing kidney disease. Make sure you check out Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you can learn more about May 1st and the National High Potassium Awareness Day and the Are You OK campaign. You can find out more on social media at Are You OK 5.1. Happy cooking, everybody. Learn about potassium in your diet. It really will allow you to eat the foods that you love and make sure you're doing that safely for your level of kidney disease and keeping your heart protected.